Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. We are in the Message to a Messed Up Church series, and today's message is called Mission Impossible Without Jesus. We'll be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 15 through 27. To follow along with the life notes, simply download them from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Peter Bunnell. And while you are sitting down, you can grab a Bible or a Bible app and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, For those of you on the Parker campus, welcome. Glad that you are here today. You can find a Bible uh, at the back of the room. Grab one of those. And we are looking, if you're using the Bibles that are here in the room, it's page 1137. Page 1137. So, um... I don't know about you guys, but I kind of really enjoy the Mission Impossible movies. Now, I haven't seen the newest one, so don't give away any spoiler alerts. But, you know, they start out pretty predictable. The agent is just living life, maybe sitting on an airplane or maybe sitting in a cafe, living their life. They're going in a certain direction, and then the agency sends them a secret message, right? And it gives, the, it gives this agent a new, a new mission that they're going to have to fulfill, okay? And um, what it does is it takes a life that's heading in one direction and switch it to, switches it around, and the agent now has this new mission that they're living for. And miraculously, like it does in all movies, it resolves in 90 minutes, Jesus wants to do that for us today, except I don't know if it will resolve in 90 minutes, but he wants to give us a new mission. We are looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're about a little bit over halfway through the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, as we come to this chapter, I think it is important for us to gain a little bit of extra insight into the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. Because the Apostle Paul was a man with a mission, and he had this mission-driven personality even before he came to Christ. You can read about Paul's life in the book of Acts, chapters 8 through 28, but I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of who he was. Before Paul was following Jesus or writing books of the Bible, his name was Saul, and Saul was completely committed to the destruction of the church. He wanted to destroy the church. He wanted to destroy believers. Saul was actually the man who approved of the killing of the first martyr of the church, Stephen. And then after Stephen was killed, Saul was like emboldened that he was going to travel around and stop the new churches that were popping up in the land of Israel. It was on his road to one of these towns that Jesus stopped Saul. Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, blinded Saul, and told Saul, stop persecuting me. Saul immediately knew that he'd encountered the Lord, and so he obeyed. He, He did what Jesus told him. He stopped. He went to a home. He was blinded from seeing Jesus. He went to a home to wait to restore his sight. And Jesus sent a man to pray for him and present the gospel to him. And when Saul received his sight back, he was baptized. And this man was transformed. Jesus changed his life Saul became a man who was committed to sharing the gospel with others. He became committed to the mission of following Christ and helping others to follow Christ. But it took a little bit of time. Saul would eventually change his name to Paul. Eventually, he became the leading apostle in the Roman Empire. He traveled all over the Mediterranean region, starting churches and encouraging believers. Eventually, Paul would become the man who would write more books of the New Testament than anyone else. 
He was committed to the mission of Christ. Jesus interrupted his life and gave him a totally new mission. And I think that's what Jesus is gonna challenge us with today. Last week, we looked at our freedom in Christ, and Pastor Chad led us in chapters eight and the end of chapter 10, right? Talking about the freedom we have in Christ, but that there are limits to that freedom. Does anyone remember any of the limits? It's a pop quiz time. I'm serious, does anyone remember? What were some of the limits? You can shout it out. Okay, the mission, right? Very good. What else was a limit? Gratitude. Gratitude. What else? Serving and love. Good, you guys got it. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so, so these were limits. And chapter nine is right in the middle. And what we have in chapter nine is the Apostle Paul expanding on what the mission is what the mission is. And what we would see if we look at all three of those chapters and just start underlining, we're gonna see that the mission is the gospel. The mission is the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 10, 33, as he's wrapping up this section, Paul wrote this. He says, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that many may be saved. Paul wanted to live a life and to do ministry so that as many people as possible could come to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. The gospel, we need to be really clear on what that is. The gospel is the good news that Jesus came because of God's love for you and me. Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, but then he died on a cross for our sins. He took that death that we deserve so that anyone who trusts in what Jesus did would be forgiven. Now, of course, Jesus was perfect, and he is God. And so death did not hold him down. Three days later, he rose again. And this proves that he can be our savior. This proves that we can trust him to give us new life and to take us to heaven. This is the gospel, and this is the mission. Has that reality changed your life? One person, really? Has that reality changed your life? Good. I'm glad to hear that. But you know, you might be here and it hasn't changed your life, and it can in an instant. It, it, it's not rocket science. It's simply trusting in what Jesus did. It's saying, hey, I know I'm heading in, in the wrong direction. I can't live life on my own. I'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna trust Jesus and I'm gonna follow him. It's trusting what Jesus did and following him. And then after you trust Jesus, he changes your life and his mission, the gospel, becomes your mission, just like it did for the apostle Paul. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, told his followers that this truth of the gospel needs to be proclaimed everywhere, to every tribe, to all people. This is a mission that he set his followers to accomplish 2,000 years ago. Now, unlike the movies, this mission will not self-destruct. It has stayed the test of time for 2,000 years. It's as real today as it was when Jesus first spoke it. So the mission, if you choose to accept it, will take time. It took time for the Apostle Paul. Paul didn't jump from being a new Christian to being a missionary. He didn't start writing the Bible the day after he was baptized. It took time. But by the time the Apostle Paul had written 1 Corinthians, he had some well-tested principles on how to complete the mission. So as we look at chapter nine, we're gonna look at Paul's principles for completing the mission. The first part of chapter nine, we don't have time to read all of chapter nine. I encourage you to read it on your own. But the first part of chapter nine, Paul talks about the fact that he gives up, gave up his right to receive money for preaching the gospel. He could have asked people to donate to him as he was preaching and traveling, but he gave up that right. Um, he could have taken a believing wife along with him, but he gave up that right. Um, he, 
he gave up the rights to eat and drink all the things that he might want to eat and drink for the sake of the gospel. So that's what the first part of chapter 9 talks about. And then uh, on the last part, we're going to start in verse 15. So if you've got your Bibles or your Bible apps, you can read along here. Verse 15. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I will have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. So Paul's first principle is to surrender your rights. Surrender your rights. He says he presents the gospel free of charge. He's not making full use of his rights. He gives up his desires. He gives up any profit he could have made. He gives up his comfort and his ease. Um, Paul was actually a tent maker. So he would actually be sewing tents and repairing tents while he did his missions work and while he traveled in order to supply for his needs. And he did all of this so he could effectively complete the mission and share the gospel. This reminds me of the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. Uh, that movie, uh, I think it's called Red Tails, tells this story of the Tuskegee Airmen. The, it, during World War II, the fighter pilots would be tasked with going to protect the bombers as they would go into enemy territory and drop bombs on the enemy. And these fighter pilots were tasked with the job of protecting the bombers. But as the movie tells it, the, the aviators were very, very committed to their own glory, right? They wanted to rack up how many enemies they could shoot down, and they wanted the thrill of the fight. So what they would do is they would leave the bombers, and they would go after the enemy fighter planes, leaving the bombers exposed. So then the bombers would get shot down. So these aviators, the first aviators that had this task, had a terrible success rate. And eventually the Air Force, despite some misplaced prejudice and low expectations, they entrusted this job to their African-American aviators. And these men hadn't been trusted with much. The Air Force didn't believe they could handle it. And when they got the mission, they were excited too. They're like, all right, great, we're gonna go, we're gonna, we're gonna do the dog fights, we're gonna get the glory now, we're gonna, notch, we're gonna put those notches on the side of our plane to show how many people we've shot down. But their commander said, no, you are sticking to the mission. You're sticking to the mission. So the Tuskegee Airmen gave up their rights for glory, their desire for fame, and they stuck to the mission. They stuck right by those bomber planes, and they were able to increase the success rate of the American Air Force because they gave up their rights and their desires. This is what Jesus asks of us. This is what Paul modeled for us, to lay aside our desires and our rights for the sake of the gospel. Can I invite you tonight to join the mission would you be willing to surrender some of your rights for the sake of the mission? You know, you have the right to a relaxing weekend. You work hard during the week. You have the right to a relaxing weeknight because you had a hard and busy day. But did you know that on Wednesday and Thursday nights, there are hundreds of kids that come, over 100 kids that come here to hear the gospel? And do you know what they need? They need adults who will love them and who will share the truth of Jesus with them and model what it means to live that way. You know, every weekend on this side of the building and on this side of the building, our classrooms are filled with over 200 kids that need to hear the gospel. 
that they need adults who will explain to them what Jesus did for them and model Jesus' care and love for them. And this is a real need. We need adults in all of those ministries. So my challenge to you is, if you're gifted and skilled and talented at working with kids or with youth, and of course, if you can pass a background check, I would love to invite you to fill out one of those Red Connect cards and let the family ministry team know that you would be willing to explore serving in those ministries and completing the mission here. Maybe you're called to a different population though. Maybe kids, that's not your thing. We need mission-driven people who are willing to work with young adults who are willing to work with those with special needs, who are willing to go and visit shut-ins who can't come to church. Maybe you have a specific population in your mind that you're like, I know these people and they need to know Jesus and I want to be a part of reaching them. Maybe you're gifted at hospitality. So welcoming people onto our campus, making coffee for them, uh, making sure they find seats. Maybe that's something that God is calling you to do. That is all mission. That is all mission. And maybe you want to use your muscles for the mission. Every Friday morning, there are men here that are moving these chairs around, getting them straight, getting them situated. Maybe that is a place you can engage in the mission. But I want to encourage you, give up some of your rights so you can engage in this mission work. Now, I just talked about ministries that are within these walls of this church. But you know, there are thousands and thousands of people outside of these walls that need people that are driven by mission, that need people that are willing to tell them about Jesus and represent Jesus to them. And I think that some of Paul's next principles will help us kind of understand how we can go about doing that. So let's keep looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 I'm at verse 19 now. So in verse 19, Paul writes, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So that gets to be a little bit of a, a mouthful, right? But let me just say this. If I could sum it up in a few words, it's relate to others. Relate to others. That's his second principle. Paul's priority was on relating to other people. So to the weak, he became weak. To the Jews, he became like a Jew. To those who were outside of the Jewish law, he became like those outside of the Jewish law. He did whatever he could to reach the people that he was tasked to tell the gospel to. So we often, when it comes to sharing the gospel, we have a come and see model, right? Jesus and his disciples did this a lot. We invite people to come and see what Jesus is doing. Come to church with me. I want you to see what's going on. Come and see what Jesus is doing. And that's a great model. Jesus used it. But we also need to engage a little bit in a go and tell model as well. Go and tell. We need to be willing to step out of our comfort zone and go and tell other people about Jesus and let them know how he has changed your life. So in 1999, when my wife and I first started dating, I told her something. I said, we're not going to go on the mission field. I knew that my wife was interested in missions. But I was like, if we're going to date, I just want you to know we're not going on the mission field. So she said, okay, great, good to know. And uh, we got married a year later, and then two years after that, we were on a short-term trip to Mongolia. We were, we were on the border with Siberia, and we were in a town of 20,000 people, and in that town in 2002, they didn't know of one 
person who was a believer in Christ. 20,000 people, not one believer that they knew of. And for me, I was like, okay, I live in California. I live in a town where there's a Christian school and there are so many churches. I don't need to be in this town in California, but I need to be in this town in Mongolia. So I told my wife, I think we should move here. <laughs> so when you go on the mission field, you have this task of relating to people, but you are reduced to the position of an infant because you arrive there and you don't know the language and you don't know the culture. Uh, you don't even know how to go to the store to buy something. Right? And so you go and you are thrust into this living situation. And what missionaries will do is they will spend years in language study and cultural acquisition. And the reason that you would do that is for the mission. It's so that you can relate to somebody and you can be able to talk with them and communicate with them and share the gospel in a meaningful way that means something to them. So let me ask you this question. How are you relating to others? For me, this is, a, this is convicting for me. You know, it's hard to sometimes learn how to relate to other people that are different than you. But we need to be relating to others. We all probably have relationships with friends and family members that need to know what Jesus have, has done in our lives. But we also need to be cultivating those relationships that maybe are new to us so that we can relate to them. Maybe God is gonna be calling you today to use your retirement to go overseas. Maybe he's gonna be calling you today to engage in using the resources that you have to send someone else overseas or to reach um, orphans that are in Honduras through our compassion ministry. There could be so many ways that God is saying, hey, catch the mission, relate to some other people. And now let's look at Paul's last principle. We find it at the end of 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So this passage is probably one of the more familiar ones. If you've heard this about running the race, you know, it's familiar, and we get that idea of running a race. And you know what's interesting about that command is that is the only command in all of chapter 9. Paul is telling everyone who's reading it, run the race. And that race is the gospel mission that he has been talking about throughout this whole chapter. Run the race. We can resonate with that sports analogy, can't we? We understand that athletes need to train, they need to build strength, they need to build endurance, they need to improve their skills, they need to know the rules of the game. Well, we need this in our gospel mission as well. We need to have spiritual strength. We need to be able to rely on Christ and on his spirit so we can run the race and finish it. We need to have the skills so we know how we can best navigate sharing this truth with other people. I didn't do a lot of sports growing up, but the one sport that I did do competitively was swimming. Now, when you're doing competitive swimming, there are a lot of little nuanced rules that you have to be aware of, right? Depending on the stroke you're doing will depend how many hands you have to touch the wall with. Uh, depending on the stroke you're doing will depend on what kick you can do and what kick you can do underwater and what kick you can do above water. And of course, when you're swimming, you have to make sure that you start at the right time. Now, nothing would be more disappointing than doing your whole race, especially if it was one of the longer swims, like you were doing four or eight laps. Nothing would be more disappointing than to do that whole entire race 
And then when you get out of the water, the judge tells you, you were disqualified. You didn't touch the wall right, or you did an extra kick when you shouldn't have. That was very, very disappointing. But the truth is, is that athletes have to be aware of that. It matters how you run the race. It matters how you play the game. So for those of us who are running the race of the mission, are you keeping yourself qualified? Are you training? Do you have places where you can study the Bible? Do you have people who you share life with? Can you tell them your struggles and do they encourage you to press on and pray for you? So you all know the place where you can get that done here at Calvary is in our life group ministry. In two weekends, the first two weekends of September, we're gonna do signups for life groups. And I hope that you will take the opportunity to plug into one of those groups because the whole point is so that we can run the race together and we can be training ourselves to run the race. If you're new to the faith, maybe you just started trusting Jesus or you're not even sure what trusting Jesus means, the Alpha class is gonna be meeting on Thursdays come September. The Alpha class would be a great place for you to plug in so you can learn more about this gospel message. Maybe you feel like you don't have enough knowledge of the Bible. So when it comes to talking to someone about God, you're like, I don't really know the Bible well enough. I don't really wanna do that. There are some opportunities that you have coming up. There's Bible studies that meet at the McCulloch campus on Sunday mornings. Uh, we have a Bible study in the book of Revelation that is gonna be starting up on Thursday nights. Can jump into that. There's women's Bible studies and men's studies that will help you read the word and understand it a little better and increase your knowledge of, of what God's word has in it. And then there's gonna be life groups. There's gonna be life groups that you can join. And the beauty of a life group is that you guys are running that race together. You'll be able to read the Bible together, talk about what it means, talk about how you're applying it to your life. You'll have people that will pray for you, that will encourage you when you fall down, encourage you to get back up. We need training partners, right? Life Groups is a place to find that. So this mission, should you choose to accept it, will require you to surrender your rights. It will require you to relate to others, and it will require you to train yourself for the race. It will not be easy but it will be rewarding. Paul ends this chapter with this hope of an imperishable reward. An imperishable reward. This is different than the trophies that you won as a kid or a high school athlete. This is different than the plaques and the accommodations that you might have earned as an adult and you have hanging on your wall. These are eternal rewards that last forever in heaven. And I hope that that hope of an eternal reward will spur you on to accept the mission which would be impossible without Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful that you changed lives, that you send Jesus to uproot us and set us on the right path Lord, this, this mission that the world would know you, that the world would trust you, that the world would see the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ, and the change that Jesus can make. Lord, we want to engage in that mission. We want that mission to be something that influences Lake Havasu, Arizona, the United States, the whole world. Help us, Lord, to join that mission and to join you in what you're doing. And Lord, we're gonna turn to communion now, a chance to remember what you did on the cross, a chance to be thankful for your body that was broken for us and your blood that was spilled for us so that we might be right with you and have a relationship with you. So Lord, we do thank you for this communion that we're about to take for all that it means for us and all that it reminds us of. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Paul's principles for completing the mission were to surrender your rights, relate to others, and train yourself. So how are you doing with your mission? If you struggle to understand what it means to follow Jesus and would like prayer or have questions, I invite you to email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. One of our pastors would be happy to get back with you. Well, that will do it for today. Have a terrific week. Bye-bye.